Hi there, and welcome to our online Resurrection Sunday service. We trust that you've had an amazing Easter weekend with your loved ones so far, and that you will be encouraged and inspired by the message today. Yes, and if this is your first time joining us, then an extra special welcome to you. We'd love to direct you to our website where you can access our online visitors brochure, which will give you some great information about our church. And we also hope to see you soon at one of our services in the church building. All our service times are available on the church website and our social media platforms will keep you updated with everything happening in the life of our church. Then just a reminder, if you have any prayer requests, you can contact us via the email address on screen. Our team would love to connect with you and pray for your needs. Yes, now church, giving to God is one of our values at Rivers Church. And we'd encourage you to use any one of the electronic means available to give your tithes and offerings to God through the local church. In Malachi 3.10, the Lord says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Our giving builds the church and enables us to do what God has called us to do, to reach and influence people for Jesus. And God promises to pour out His blessings over our lives when we give out of obedience with a heart for the kingdom. Yes, well, we hope that you're ready for today's message. Let's lean in and be encouraged. Our Discipleship College offers various unique short courses with long-term value. This term, the courses on offer are the Holy Spirit in Introduction, the Seven Churches of Revelation, the Call to Full-Time Ministry, and a brand new marriage course by Pastor Dean and Pastor Yannette, running on Tuesday nights between 7 and 9 p.m. Term 1 for 2022 begins on the 3rd of May and registrations are open but limited due to COVID restrictions. So book online or at the info counter to secure your seat. Moms and dads, we're so excited to announce that we have child dedications coming up on the weekend of the 23rd and 24th of April. During this special service, our pastors pray for your children, blessing them and committing them to the purposes of God. All COVID protocols will be followed, so if you'd like to be included, please sign up at the info counter after the service or send an email to the address on screen. Jesus. He's the author. He's the perfecter. He's the finisher of your faith. He's all you need. And a very happy Easter to you. So good to see you here this morning. It is Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Now, as you saw in news, there's lots of good things coming up in the life of the church. But ladies, this Friday night coming is sisters. And, um, you know, we've had a phenomenal sisters post-COVID. Every month the ladies gather. We lift this roof. 
worshiping Jesus and we have a ton of fun at the same time. And I'm especially excited about this Friday night um, because as some of you might know, at the end of 2019, I was diagnosed with cancer. And for the whole of 2020, while the world was dealing with COVID, I was dealing with chemo. And so um, I'm going to be sharing on that journey this Friday night and um, I think it will really encourage people. So ladies, book a seat, invite some friends who would be encouraged as well. Bookings open on Tuesday and we'd love to see you here, your children in Kid Zone and your teenage boys at Guys Night, all in one place. Won't you stand to your feet and let's pray as we go to the Word. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you that we can come and celebrate today that Jesus is risen. And so Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this place. We ask that you would have your way as the word is preached. Will you minister to every single heart here today? Will you point us in the way that we need to go? We commit ourselves to you. We commit the word to you in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, as we start today, I want to tell you something about a man called Thomas Jefferson. Now, he was the third president of the United States. He had a brilliant mind. He was highly regarded as a great statesman. And he was also the author of the Declaration of Independence, which is the well-known document that united the American states and in which they declared their independence from Britain. But unfortunately, in 1820, Thomas Jefferson also published a book called The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. And this book became known as the Jefferson Bible. Now, what Thomas Jefferson did was that he went to the Bible, he cut out all the pieces he wanted, and he stuck them together in this book. So he took verses from the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he put them in this book. Now, Thomas Jefferson highly regarded Jesus Christ as an excellent, brilliant moral teacher and philosopher. Um, and so he took all the pieces that spoke about the teachings and the doctrines of Jesus and any actions of Jesus that um, highlighted these doctrines, all of those went into this book as well. However, he made very sure that he did not include anything that could remotely reference to the supernatural or the miraculous. So any miracles of Jesus, any reference to angels or the Holy Spirit, any reference to the kingdom that is to come or eternal life or judgment that is coming, heaven, hell, the devil, angels, none of that made it into his Bible. In fact, he was so adamant that he did not want to include any of that, that if a passage um, kind of continued, he would cut it off mid-verse and stick the part in that he liked. And um, the historian Edwin Gaustad commented on this work and said, if a moral lesson was embedded in a miracle, the lesson survived in Jeffersonian scripture, but the miracle did not. Now, the Jefferson Bible ends with cutouts from John 19 and Matthew 27 combined, and this is what it says, taken from the King James. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, which is a tomb, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher, and departed. And the Jefferson Bible ends with Jesus dead in the tomb. Just another great man, another great teacher who came, had his moment of fame, and then died. And what a tragic way to view Jesus. Amen. Paul puts it like this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, then we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. 
But thank God, Easter Friday was not the end of the story. Amen. Thank God the tomb is empty and they could never find his body because Jesus is alive. Amen. Christ is is risen. And so this morning, I want to share with you a few thoughts around the message title, Christ is risen. He is risen. And if you're taking notes today, He is risen. Now, for centuries, many Christians all over the world have greeted each other with this greeting, with these very words. One would say, Christ is risen, and the other would respond, yes, he is risen indeed. And over the centuries, this greeting became known as the Paschal greeting. And so the Paschal lamb is the lamb that gets slaughtered during Passover. And it reminds the Jewish people of the fact that God rescued them out of Egypt and that when the angel of death went through the land, he would see the blood of the Paschal lamb smeared on the doorposts and he would pass over those homes of the Israelites. Now, Jesus Christ was crucified during the Passover. And when God sees his blood over our lives, then he passes over us, he forgives us our sins, and he gives us eternal life. I mean, he's, he rescues us from eternal death. But as we say, Jesus didn't just die. And in fact, this whole Easter, we've been saying he is risen, he has moved from death to life. And so the Paschal greeting is not, he died for you. The Paschal greeting is, he is Risen, And in fact, those words we find three times uh, recorded in three of the Gospels. And I want to look at the account of Luke. And Jesus in, by now had already died and is laid in the tomb. And then in Luke 24, we read this. Very early on Sunday morning, the woman went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. Jesus was very much dead but then he was very much alive again. Amen. And throughout all of history, Jesus is the only person who had ever predicted his death and resurrection and had many others predict his death and resurrection and then made good on that promise. And this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. In other words, go and check for yourselves. And though some have died. And then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, Paul says, I also saw him. You know, over the years, and in fact, over the centuries, many people have investigated the claims of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they have found overwhelming proof that in fact, it really did happen. It was an historical fact that Jesus died and rose again. 
and I came across the story of two very important gentlemen who thought that this whole story of Jesus and Christianity was just a great elaborate scam and it was just a pack of lies and so they wanted to set out to disprove it. And so in the mid 18th century, Lord George Littleton, who was a member of the British Parliament, and Gilbert West Esquire, gentlemen, went to Oxford. And there they were determined to attack the very basis of Christianity and expose it as a fraud. So Littleton set out to prove that Saul of Tarsus never converted to Christianity. And of course, Saul became Paul and wrote most of our New Testament. And then West went out to disprove that Jesus never rose from the dead. And so they decided to take a full year, each of them going their own way, doing a meticulous investigation, and they were going to get back at the end of the year and report on their amazing findings and how clever they were in showing that it was all a hoax. But as the year progressed, they slowly came to the shocking realization that everything was true. And at the end of that year, they had both become Christians. And, um, you know, their correspondence back and forth during that year show how surprised they were at the quality of the evidence that they found. And, you know, I always get such a kick out of hearing stories like that because their experience is not unique at all. There are so many well-documented stories of highly intelligent individuals who think they're so clever and they are going to disprove this whole thing only for them to fall at the feet of Jesus themselves. Amen. The great British preacher Charles Spurgeon put it like this. He said, the resurrection is a fact better attested than any event recorded in any history, whether ancient or modern. And then the English bishop and Bible commentator J.C. Ryle said this, in an age of abounding unbelief and skepticism, we shall find that the resurrection, resurrection of Christ will bear any weight that we can lay upon it. Christ is risen, amen. He is risen indeed. And that is wonderful news for us this morning. But now we have to say, now what? What does it mean for you and I that Jesus Christ is risen? And so in the time that we have left, I just want to look at a few things and remind us of a few things that the resurrection of Jesus proves. Does that sound like a plan? Amen. So the first thing that it proves is that Jesus is who he said he was. The fact that Jesus is risen proves that he is who he said he was. You know, during his time on earth, Jesus said many radical things. John 14 verse 6, we see how he spoke to some of the Jews and he said, I am the way and the truth, in other words, absolute truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That was radical stuff. That was a radical thing to say. In fact, he frequently freaked the Jewish leaders out so much that they kept trying to kill him. And in John 10, we read this. Once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. And Jesus said, at my father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one are you going to stone me? And they replied, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. Now, you know, if Jesus walked around today and said that he was God, we would think he's a fruitcake, right? They thought he was demon-possessed. We are more sophisticated. We probably would stick him in a psychiatric hospital. People walking around making radical claims like that. But the fact is that Jesus did die and he did rise again. Amen. Just like he said he would. And because he is risen, it proves that what he said is right. It proves that he is God because only God can rise from the dead. It also proves that he did not sin because the consequences of death is sin. 
It proves the acceptance of his sacrifice of himself in the sight of God. Because if the sacrifice was not acceptable, he would have stayed dead. Isn't that right? And it proves his word because he said he would die and rise again. And that is exactly what he did. And because all of those things are proven true by the fact that he is risen, it also means that everything else he said is true. So everything he said about forgiveness and about um, the power of prayer, what he said about the kingdom of God coming, about heaven and hell and the coming judgment, everything is proven true because Jesus is risen. Now, secondly, the fact that Jesus is risen proves that what the Bible says is true. What the Bible says is true. You know, so often people these days, and even Christians, refer to the Old Testament as a bunch of stories. They're all allegories or fables just to highlight a deeper truth. They didn't actually happen. But that is not how Jesus saw the Old Testament. He frequently spoke about the characters and the events that took place in the Old Testament. And by the way he spoke, it's clear that he saw it as historical fact. He spoke about Adam and Eve. He spoke about Noah and the flood. He spoke about Jonah. He spoke about Moses and Abraham, the serpent in the wilderness, Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, all those things Jesus spoke about, and he declared them truth by what he said. And in fact, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, we read this in Matthew 4 verse 4, that was in the wilderness, and Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus confirmed that the Bible is true and that it is the word of God. Amen. And so importantly, the Bible also points to Jesus. You know, Bible commentators estimate that there are over 400 prophecies, appearances, and foreshadowings in the Old Testament that all point to Jesus. In fact, Jesus said this to the Jewish leaders in John 5. He said, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. You know, every prophecy Jesus made, it all came true. And the Bible is proven true because Jesus is risen. And that is such good news for you and me today because that means that we can build our lives on the rock solid foundation of the entire council of the Bible. When the Bible gives us promises, we can stand on those because it's got the seal of approval by the risen Jesus. Amen. Yes, I think we can give God praise for that this morning. Now, thirdly, because Jesus is uh, risen, we can overcome every difficulty in this life. We can overcome every difficulty in this life. All our challenges and difficulties, all our fears and anxieties, we can face them because Jesus is risen. And you know, I think the, one of the most beautiful pictures in the Bible of this happening to people is the transformation that the disciples went through. They got transformed and became a, a people who were able to face everything that life threw at them. You know, when, when Jesus got arrested, the Bible tells us that they were scared. They, they ran away. And then after Jesus was crucified and laid in the tomb, John 20 tells us where they were found. It says that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. You know, these were scared people fearing for their lives. These were not world changers. But on top of that, they were devastated. They were completely uh, overcome by their grief. And we, we read a bit later that Jesus w appeared on the road to Emmaus to two of his followers. And as he started walking with them, Luke 24 says this. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you're walking along? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. You know, Jesus' disciples and followers were scared. 
they were fearful, they were sad, they were overcome by what had happened to them. But then they encountered the risen Jesus, not just once, but many times over the course of 40 days. They saw him time and time again. Then they saw him being raised up into heaven. And after that, they got filled with the Holy Spirit. And we see this scared, ragtag group of disciples transformed into these powerful, fearless, courageous people going out to tell the world about Jesus Christ. What had happened? They had seen the risen Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit had filled them. And you know, over the course of a few short years, we see this small group of believers in Judea, in the back end of the Roman Empire, in the middle of nowhere, and their message spread across the entire world that Jesus overcame death. And you know, it's easy to think, oh, they had it all together. But those people faced intense opposition, terrible persecution. Those early Christians lost everything. They lost their homes, their possessions. They got kicked out of society. They were deemed as lesser than. Many of them lost their lives in horrible ways. And yet, they were able to overcome every difficulty life threw at them because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Romans 8 verse 11 says this, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. The dead body of Jesus was resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, His power and His presence is available to every single person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know, church, we've had a horrible week again. We have faced intense flooding. We have had people go through very traumatic experiences this week. Many people have lost everything, even in our church. Homes, possessions, businesses. Many people escaped with only the clothes on their backs and many people did not make it. In fact, the death toll last time I checked was standing over 400 already. On top of that, many people sitting here have not had power or water for at least a week now. It has been an incredibly tough week already. And you know, just this week I had a conversation with a friend and she said to me, how much more must we take? We've been through COVID, we've endured the riots and the looting, and now we've got the floods, how much more? And you know, the reality is in our own strength, we cannot face any more. In our own strength, we have reached breaking point a long time ago. But thank God, Jesus is risen and His Holy Spirit is the one that empowers His people to stand up in the face of opposition and to say, we can keep going. God will see us through because the power of the risen Jesus is available to us. Amen. And that is good news today. And then lastly, because Jesus is risen, we have the hope of eternal life. We have the hope of eternal life. Death is not the end for us. Now, in England, just outside London, there's a small village called Tewin. And in this village of Tewin, there's um, St. Peter's Churchyard. And there stands a four-trunked tree. And it's a massive thing growing out of a grave. And the grave out of which the tree is growing is the grave of Lady Anne Grimson. And she died in 1713 at the age of 60. Now, it's a very interesting story because Lady Anne Grimston was extremely wealthy and she did not believe in life after death. And so when she was lying on her deathbed, she said this to a friend. She says, it is as unlikely that I shall continue to live as that a tree will grow out of my body. And she was buried in a marble tomb. The grave was marked by a large marble slab and surrounded by an iron railing. Years later, the marble slab was found to be moved a little. 
Then it cracked, and through the crack, a small tree grew. Today, growing right from the heart of her grave, is one of the largest trees in England, with four root trees growing from one root. And her grave, they say, is a heap of broken stone. And this is what how one author puts it. He says, for over 200 years, the trunks have forced their way through the tomb to raise their branches in a silent but powerful triumph. Because Jesus lives, we will live forever too. Amen. And you know, that is such a great comfort for us today, especially for those of us who have lost loved ones in recent times. Because Jesus is risen, we will rise too. And when we do, this is what the Bible promises us in Revelation 21. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Amen. That is our hope and our trust today because Jesus is risen and we will live in eternity for him too, with him too. And I love how the pastor Charles Swindle puts it. He says, we think we are in the land of the living, going to the land of the dying. But in fact, we are in the land of the dying, going to the land of the living. Amen. Death for the believer is only a doorway to walk through to Jesus. Won't you close your eyes with me this morning and bow your heads? And we've spoken at length today about the fact that Jesus did die and he did rise again and that he offers the free gift of salvation, which is the forgiveness of sins and an eternity in heaven with him. But it's a gift that needs to be accepted. If you think it's your birthday and someone hands you a beautifully wrapped gift, but you don't stretch your hands out to take it, well, whatever is in there doesn't matter because you're not accepting the gift. In the same way, Jesus has purchased the most expensive gift of all time for you. He has paid the price for your soul, but you still need to make the acceptance of that gift. You still have to reach out and say, thank you, I gratefully accept this gift. And so what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to pray for people who need to accept that gift of Jesus, who need to surrender their lives to Jesus and say, Jesus, not my will, but your will. I make you king of my life. I believe and I accept your salvation. And I'm not going to embarrass anyone this morning or make you stand up or come to the front, but simply where you are, in a moment, I will count to three. And if you need to make right with Jesus, you will raise your hands. I will acknowledge it and you can put it down again and we will all pray together with you. Do not miss this moment. Do not live a life that says, I'll get to Jesus one day. The floods again this week showed us that none of us know how much time we have left on earth. And whether we accept the gift of Jesus or not will determine where we spend eternity. Amen. This is important. Don't sit on the fence. You might have been in church all your life, but your life from Monday to Saturday shows that you don't believe Jesus. Don't be a Sunday Christian. Give your life to Jesus fully. Surrender to Him fully. Your will for His will. Amen. And if you've never made that decision before, Accept Jesus Christ today. There are many religions and many philosophies out there. They promise all sorts of things. But those leaders are all still dead in their graves. Their bones are there. Jesus is the only one who became alive again. And therefore, you can only place your trust in Jesus. Amen. If that's you today, we are going to pray. One, two, three, raise your hand. Say, yes, that's me. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you over there, I see that hand. Thank you over there. Anyone else? Thank you over there. Don't let this moment miss you by. Raise your hand and say, yes, that's me. Include me in this prayer. I'm coming back to Jesus. Thank you, I see that hand. I accept his free gift. Thank you. Thank you over there. One last call. Amen. We're going to all pray together to support you, but this prayer is for you as you've raised your hand. Heavenly Father, 
Heavenly Father, I thank You for Jesus. I come to You today declaring that I'm a sinner in need of Your grace. Thank You, Jesus, that You died for my sins. And thank You, Jesus, that You rose again. Today, Lord, I accept Your free gift of salvation I surrender my life to you in full. Come inside, Lord. Wash me clean. Forgive my sins. Make me a new creation. Thank you that from today, I am a Christian. I am a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come church, let's thank God for those people who responded. Thank you. And in a moment, I will dismiss the service. And if you've made that decision this morning, the most important decision you've made, and it's only the start of your journey with Jesus. And so if you can stop by the info counter after the service and you can um, collect a pack there that will just help you on the next steps in your journey with God. But it's been so lovely to have you here today. Thank you for coming. Don't forget to grab your speckled eggs on the way out. If you still need to give, the offering boxes are there. Ladies, book on Tuesday for sisters on Friday. Have a very blessed day. God bless.